All right. Hello, everyone. How, how you doing? Everyone doing okay? Getting there, getting there. All right. So, Friday? Is anyone going Friday? Good, good, good. So here's the deal. The museum kind of misled me, so I actually have to apologize indirectly. <coughs> they originally told me they can do tours throughout the day on Friday, but they told me they can only do tours starting at 2. I don't know why, but that's what they told me. So in the event that some of you can't come at 2, where are you planning on coming? Can any of you come at 2? Okay, so in the event that you can't do 2 o'clock, send me an email. Because I can give you a discount ticket, and you can go back with your family or whatever at your own time, okay? I, I apologize. Originally, she said, yeah, any time Friday for closing. So I made, like, time scattered throughout the day. Uh, but then she said all the tours start at 2. So uh, my apologies. If you can't come at 2, I'll give you the same discount ticket for the same price. Uh, and you can come back later with your family at any time, okay? Good. So I hope I'll see some of you at 2. If I don't, then uh, uh, it, the exhibit's there until August, so you have plenty of time to go. All right, any questions? Anything in your mind? Okay, so someone asked, so I will tell you. Uh, this morning, feels like forever already. Uh, uh, long days. So I'll, I'll be on. Uh, I'll be on NPR tomorrow morning, so you can hear the short version. But here, you get the long version. Um, yeah, KUHF. Maybe listen to it. So what happened was in the Supreme Court today was a case McCutcheon versus FEC. So the government puts limits on the amount of money that individuals can contribute to candidates. And there are two types of limits relevant for this case. The first limit says you can't give more than about $2,600 to a given candidate. This is called a base limit. So if you like this member of Congress or that member of Congress, in a two-year cycle, you can only give $2,600. So that's one limit. Another type of limit is something called an aggregate limit. That says that you can't give more than roughly $120,000 total to all candidates. So say if you give $2,000 to one candidate, that means you're roughly capped off at 60 candidates you can back. The 60 times 20 is about 120, right? So what the Supreme Court said today was the base caps are okay, but the aggregate caps, and you can't give more than $120,000 total, are not okay. That unduly limits your freedom of speech. So the court found that that limitation was unconstitutional. It violates the First Amendment. Now, a lot of you are going to hear this is like the worst thing in the world. It's the worst thing since Dred Scott. It's going to make campaign finance blow up. That's largely overstated, right? For the simple reason why is that it's already quite possible for people to spend money on campaigns, but not through candidates' projections, but through things called PACs and super PACs and super duper PACs and all these other things, right? So if you're wealthy and you want influ influence on election, it's very easy. You don't need to do this, right? This actually mostly impacts smaller people who are wealthy who don't have these super PACs. So the impact of this decision is actually fairly small. What can be big, though, is what happens next, the next uh, shoe to fall. Um, and it looks like campaign finance laws, which don't do much to get money out of politics. Last election, I think Obama raised a billion, a billion dollars, and Romney raised like $950 million, so roughly the same amount. So, I mean, there's no shortage of money going to politics. All these other things are, are, are mostly for show and make people feel good about themselves. So these laws probably won't be around for long, and whether they're here or not, they won't make a difference. The next presidential election will perhaps raise a billion dollars as well. And they will find various ways to have all these ancillary and secondary groups to flood your TVs with airwaves and commercials. Now, a good part about living in Texas is you don't have to see commercials around election season. Very few, right? If you're in a swing state, like when I was in Virginia in 2008, every single commercial was for the presidential election. So a good part about living in a non-swing state is you don't have to worry about those commercials. But uh, maybe you'll see them this fall, but probably not. All right, questions on anything else like that? When do you guys take Hanlo next year, right? Okay. Yeah, you'll 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 it might be my class. I don't know. I am teaching it next year. I don't know which semester though. No, I think I'm teaching it next spring. Do you know when you're taking it? Sorry. Oh well. Actually, I think there's a thing they don't want class having the same section having the same professor twice. I don't, I don't know if that's a rule, but I've seen that uh, anecdotally. Like I'll never have the same section for property one and two. It. It's never worked out that way. But maybe we will eventually. What's that? Have you had the same professor twice? They, they try not to, and I, I don't know, like I said, it's a policy of some sort. Okay, everyone ready to go on? Any questions? Maybe it's for your benefit, I don't know. Maybe mine. So, I, the other thing is if people don't like the grades and they get a little grumbling. Speaking of grades, so I posted the sample exam tonight, okay? If you go to the class page, it's there. Um, I encourage you, do it on your own. Give yourself 90 minutes. Take your time and do it. And there's also a sample answer. Don't look at the answer. Don't cheat. Try to actually... 
everyone tries to cheat, right? Try to take it for real. Give yourself 90 minutes. At some point, I'm going to schedule a review session. It'll be, uh, I think it's going to be the last day of class. We might stay a little bit later than we usually do to make sure we have enough time to go over it, but it's going to be an in-class review session. It'll probably be closer to two hours and 90 minutes, but that's for your own benefit, not mine. And what I want to do is actually proctor the test, give you time to take it. Like, we can even start, like, at 7.15 or we can start it earlier, and then we can, we can figure out the times later. But you'll take the entire test, and then what I'll do is I'll go over a sample A-plus answer. Okay? That's good? And, I, uh, and so I encourage you to take a look at the sample question. There are a bunch of other exams on the, on the website. Every exam I've ever given is on there. You can find it very easily. And this will help you prepare for the test. So you'll know what, know what to expect. I'm not that creative, right? So if you see exams from like last year, it's going to be in the ballpark what you get this year. It's going to be roughly similar. Yes, sir? <clears throat> yes, it's already there. But I posted it up top so people see it. <laughs> so you don't have to dig for it. I, yeah. Okay. What else? Anything else? Other questions? Yeah. Don't worry. There are so many sample exam questions. Every time I teach this class, I get more questions. So there's plenty of stuff you to work with. Your only constraint is you want to take the time to do it, which I would encourage strongly. All right. Anything else? Any questions on marital property part one, where we talked about common law property? Okay. So last class, we did all the elements of getting married. So today, we'll do the elements of getting divorced. Okay? And, and divorce law is actually uh, fascinating. Um, today, it's such a prevalent aspect of our society. I mean, the numbers are uh, quite staggering. So here are the most recent numbers. So 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 67% of second marriages end in divorce. And for third marriages, 74%. So if you get married a third time, there's a three-quarters chance that you will wind up divorced. Okay. Uh, the numbers vary a little, but these, these are the most recent numbers I've seen. Um, what's also interesting is how, uh, one thing which I'm not going to get into, is uh, divorce rates with inter-religion uh, uh, marriage. Because generally with, uh, when you have two people of the same faith, the chances of getting divorced are much less. And when there's different faith, the chances go up significantly. So, for example, uh, this, was, this is an old study, but uh, if there were two Protestants, mainline Protestants have already defined it, that the divorce rate was about 20%. And if there was a Catholic and an Evangelical, it rose to 33%. And if it was a Jewish person and a Christian, it rose to 40%, which is actually a very close link between faith and, and uh, divorce, which is fascinating. Uh, Interestingly enough, the divorce rate's dropping, but not for the reasons you think. It's that people tend to get married less and are getting married later in life when they have more money and more assets and they're more set up and they have prenups and other things like that. So there's a much less number of people getting married earlier in life. Okay. Um, we take this almost for granted, but in the United States, divorce wasn't common like until the 1970s, right? And around the world, divorce was, was legalized fairly late. For example, Italy legalized divorce in 1970, Portugal 1975, Spain 1981, Ireland 1996, yeah, yeah, Malta 2011. It's actually still illegal in the Philippines uh, and Vatican City, although I'm not sure who's getting married in Vatican City, but, you know, in, in, oh, France is really going out there. No, but... Uh, uh, yeah, but, but it basically was not a, a problem. And the reason why was for much of history, the fiction of a man and wife forming this third person wasn't just a useful property device. That was actually the spiritual belief that when a man and woman get married, that they actually form this holy spiritual essence that the Lord must protect and God damn we won't let them separate. Right? They, they, they did not let people um, separate. This is why we actually have like the Church of England because Henry VIII wanted a divorce, I mentioned this, and the king, the Pope wouldn't give it to him. So he started a religion that allows divorces. Um, we won't get too much into the concept of uh, prenuptial agreements. Uh, you'll do that in family law, but those are fairly uh, uh, common now. And generally, a prenuptial agreement, if it's you know on reasonable terms and it was arrived at jointly, will trump all the stuff I'm about to tell you. In other words, if you have a valid and good prenup, that will control, not whatever the, 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 the marriage law of the state says. So everything we're saying now is no prenup. 
Got it? It's also called an anti-nuptial. Anti and pre are effectively the, the same word in before. So anti-nuptial or pre-nuptial, you'll see both words. Okay? All right, so the, the major rise in divorce is a result of something called the no-fault divorce. So historically, in order to get divorced, there had to be allegations of adultery, um, cruelty, abuse, abandonment, right? One of the spouses, almost invariably the woman, would have to plead that my husband beat me. My husband abandoned me, right? He was cruel to me. And only in that case would a court grant a divorce. So think about this. If there's no allegations of abuse, there's no allegation of adultery, husband and wife are just unhappy together. They were stuck. They, they couldn't get divorced. You, in, in, before the 1950s or 60s, you could not go to a court and say, you know, this just, this just isn't working. We, it's not working out. Couldn't do that. So California in the 1970s popularized something called the no-fault divorce. And what that effectively says is, to no fault of either party, both spouses can go to a court and petition for a divorce. Now that exists in most states, but usually it's modified in a lot of states. For example, in uh, Virginia, where I went to law school, the law was such that you could only get a divorce without fault after one year of waiting. Right? No waiting period for guns, but waiting periods for divorces. So effectively, it's true. So effectively, you would go to a court, you petition saying, my husband and I, you know, we, we have irreconcilable differences. And they, okay, good, come back in a year. We'll, get, we'll grant you a divorce. Uh, there was actually a provision that if you, if you sign a property settlement agreement, they cut that to six months, but you're still waiting. And this exists in a lot of states. Um, uh, various mechanisms to make it harder to get divorced. And, and you know, there's, there's a decent policy argument that marriages should be, uh, you know, try to maintain, you should discourage divorces. Um, but that, that, that year can be a long year, if you, if you could imagine. Um, and, but the, the alternative is in California, you can be done in a couple days. I mean, not, not there's money involved, but you could effectively be done very quickly. And then people get remarried, and who knows. Once the divorce is triggered, though, the, tr the most difficult part is how do you separate the assets? And these rules vary, uh, vary somewhat between a common law and a community property state, such as Texas. Today we'll be talking a lot about the common law, and next week we'll do community. So, so just hold your horses for your Texas questions. Do that next week. Okay. There are two main approaches of how property can be split up. The first one is called equitable distribution. And the second one is called equal distribution. You want to ask, Josh, aren't those the same thing? Well, no, they're, they're actually quite different. Okay, <laughs> Equitable, like equity, means fairness. With equitable, the court will consider all the very equitable principles and try and divide it fairly. Equal means equal, 50-50 split. So you can see the difference there. Say if there was one spouse who earned almost all the money and did all the work and you know brought all the bacon home, right? Under an equitable distribution, that spouse would probably get more. Under an equal distribution, 50-50. Where perhaps there was a spouse that uh, took care of all the kids and, uh, you know, shouldered all the homework, that could be factored in. Okay? Oh, to answer the question, why did I go to law school in Virginia? Um, at the time, I was working for the Department of Defense in Arlington, and the law school was about five minutes from where I worked, and it was a, somewhat of a stupid decision, but I decided to go to law school. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go later to the value of a law school degree. I promise I'll talk about that. <laughs> That's actually a very nice seg. So, uh, I'll do it now. So, I'm sure a lot of you, when you were reading that um, case from Colorado, you're wondering, what's the value of a law degree, right? What the heck am I getting myself in for? Did some of you wonder that? Is my law degree valuable? So it's interesting, and, and I can say this uh, from uh, uh, my from law school, I knew several people from law school who got divorced during or shortly after law school, okay? 
this is, it's actually, <laughs> lawyers have a very high rate of divorce, suicide, depression, substance abuse. Talk to friends about this. This is actually a serious deal. You have an obligation as members of the bar to look out for this because it's such a high instance of depression, divorce, and suicide. It's actually really bad for our profession. So, but the question I know here is, what's the value of a law degree? So I actually had a friend. Uh, he was married, and he and his wife had an arrangement. The wife would go to law school first for three years, right? And then while she was at law school, the husband would work and support. Then when she graduates, she'll be a lawyer, and then she'll support him through law school, right? Well, that, that worked halfway, right? So, so, so she, she went to law school. She graduated. She got a prestigious clerkship, went to go work for a big, snazzy law firm. And within, I think by his, by the end of his first year of law school, she had filed for divorce. So, so she, he had paid her way through law school, taking a lots of debt and loans to fund her law school. She graduates, goes on to the job market, gets a fancy law firm job, and they file for divorce. Now, they had other marriage problems. I'm not trying to say that she was trying to pull Wendy Davis or something, but, but she, oh, you knew I was going there. Oh, I'll, so Wendy, Wendy, Wendy. So I've actually, <laughs> this, is, this is not political, but I, I've been obsessed with this story. So you know Wendy Davis was the governor, a rank for governor of, of uh, Texas. So, yeah, yeah, she, she is, yeah, she, she's running. And uh, she won the primary. So she went to Harvard Law School, okay? And, oh, let me back up. So she, there are all these stories about when she was younger and she raised kids in a trailer park and, you know, whatever. We, we can put those stories aside. But at some point in her early 20s, in her early 20s, she got married to a very wealthy lawyer who was uh, about 10 or 15 years older than her. And I think he was, like, in city government or state government. He had some, some governmental position. And at the time, Wendy Davis had two young children, and she uh, decided to go to law school. So she was um, admitted to Harvard Law. It was funny. She, what did she say? Uh, uh, she basically dissed Baylor. No, SMU. Uh, she said, I could have gone to SMU. I want to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Ugh, yeah, that's going to play well. Well, Greg Abbott went to Vanderbilt, so whatever. So, uh, not, not House of Cards, right? So, so anyway, so, so, so Davis was um, decided to go to Harvard. And she allegedly brought her children with her for the first year of law school. I don't believe this because her story has changed many times. It's not feasible to keep two kids by yourself in Boston as a first-year law student. It's not feasible. I'm guessing they visited her. They didn't visit the second or third year. They visited the first year. So I think the story is somewhat inconsistent. Anyway, but her husband basically paid for her to go to law school. And she said she came home every weekend, then became every other weekend, then came once a month, whatever. She graduated law school and started working uh, as an attorney in, in Dallas. Her husband gave this interview that I'm sure he regretted, where he said... <laughs> The day after I paid off her loan, she moved out. <laughs> Ew, yeah. The and, and I'm sure he regrets this one. I'm sure the reporter got him off the record on that one. So, and you can look this up. You can Google this. The husband said, it seems the day after she moved out, I'm sorry, it seems the day after I paid off her loans, her last loan payment, she, she moved out. <laughs> so that's actually fairly common, apparently, because I know several people whom that happened to. So in law school, you go, you pay, and they move out, right? So this is fairly common. Now, the other question, what is a value of a law degree? What are you getting yourselves into? So I'm sure you're all quite aware that the legal market now is not quite good, and may, maybe you're concerned. So I shall address this at several levels. So the undisputable fact is there are more lawyers than law jobs. Okay, this, this is a matter of simple economics. There are more law students being produced than there are jobs for lawyers. And I'm sure all of you know this. If you don't, now you do. Okay. So what does that mean going forward? Is this some sort of a temporary blip, or will this correct itself? And it's hard to say. I think there's actually seeing drops in the number of people going to law school. So there actually will probably be a decrease in the number of lawyers being produced, but probably not nearly enough to compensate for the fact that there aren't more jobs being created. Right? There aren't more lawyer jobs being created. In fact, they're actually being decreased. Legal services are being outsourced to India and China and other places, and various forms of technology are replacing things that lawyers should do. All right? So even if the number of lawyers is dropping, the number of, uh, what do you call it, um, law jobs would probably be flat. Right? So does that mean that the value of your law degree will be not worth it? So the tuition here at South Texas is actually fairly reasonable, which I'm sure for some of you that might have been a reason why you came here. It's less than other similarly priced, I'm sorry, similarly ranked private institutions. And the fact that you're in Texas, 
gives you another boost because the employment situation here is, is much better. In fact, Texas booms our employment numbers in ways I don't think most people appreciate. Like, Texas' general level of employment makes us look good, which, which, is, which is perfectly fine. God bless Texas. But what exactly is the value of a law degree? And one chart which I like to share, this is actually from a paper published about a year ago. I know the author, really bright guy, um, which tries to map the value of a law degree throughout a person's lifetime, basically from the age of 25 to the age of 65. And a couple of things jump out at this. Okay? The first thing that jumps out, it might reflect what you commonly know, lawyers start off not making a lot of money. I'm sure if you know a lot of people recently graduated, they are either unemployed or, as we say, underemployed or, or doing part-time work. Okay? And that, that's absolutely true, and this reflects in the graph. In fact, those with bachelor degrees only tend to start off doing a little bit better. But this course correction changes very quickly. So the value added of having a law degree after you hit 30 or so, and I understand for night students it's different because you're starting your law degree at a different time. So just assume within a couple years of law school, more, more or less. Right? So at some point after you've been law school a number of years, the paths cross. And you can actually see over the course of a lifetime, the law degree adds a lot more value to what you would have with just a bachelor's degree. And I see everyone peaks out at their maximum earning potential around 50. And then that's downhill. And it's actually a steep drop for lawyers, which is also interesting. But generally speaking, you get a nice bump for having a law degree. Now, what is the actual numerical value of what a law degree adds? So I'm going to bore you with a little bit of math. Does anyone understand that you have percentiles? You know what a bell curve is, right? If you're at the 50th percentile, you're at the, the mean, the median. You're at the middle of the curve. Then you have a bottom quartile and a top quartile, 75%. So at the mean, on average, a law degree will add roughly $999,000 to your, to, your, to your income. And that's in 2012 dollars in present value. So that will adjust with inflation. So you're, you're, you're paying, so let's, let's make even $150,000 for tuition. Is that a bad ballpark? How, what's your estimate? How much? I just heard tuition. It's less than I'm I'm adding everything conceivable. Is that is well, is that like I mean I'm like, I'm going for a high end estimate like 150 is like a high end estimate. I'm going for a, 150 right whatever right. Yeah 150 make it easier. So on average, and let's and let's say that you know doubles with with interest over, over your lifetime right. Let's just make it 300 really like exaggerating numbers right. Let's make it 300. If the mean amount of dollars that's added to your law degree is about a million. And you're investing, say, three hundred thousand dollars in a law degree, you're making out ahead, right? Of course, you saw the depression, the suicide, the other stuff. But, but <laughs> financially wise, <laughs> I'm serious. You have to work seriously. Look out for your friends and colleagues. This is a big deal. Okay? At the seventy-fifth percentile, meaning above the mean, you're at over a million dollars. At the fifty percentile, even at the even if you're in the middle of the pack, it doesn't mean middle of your class because class rank and success are very <laughs> not linked at all. But if you're in the middle of the pack of lawyers, you're still making about six hundred thousand dollars. Even if you're at the bottom tail, you know, the bottom twentieth percentile, you're still making nearly three hundred fifty thousand dollars over a lifetime. So for almost everyone, law school is a good bet. Just about everyone, not not everyone. And I'm sure if you go down far enough, you have people who are actually making less than the value of their degree, probably making in the two hundred thousand dollar range. They're not good. Like they're not going to be well off. But that is at the bottom end of the curve, and that's probably the fewest number of people. And, and, and you should know very clearly, law school rank, class rank, that doesn't matter much after a point. That only matters your first job or two. That, that, that stuff is not a very good predictor of success. It, it drops very quickly. No, it's, it's true. Yeah. So, so my, my and, and what's interesting also is it's, it's, it's fairly consistent for genders, too. I mean, there are certain gender gaps, but it's actually... It's in the ballpark, right? They're usually the women, the ladies, tend to make a little less. We'll talk about that another time. But it's in the ballpark. It's not. They're not. They're not radically different. So over a lifetime, generally speaking, for most people, a law degree is a good bet. For most people, not everyone, but for most people. So, what's the value of a law degree? In present day dollars, probably a million dollars added to your bonus if you just had an undergraduate degree. Right? So whatever the value is having an undergraduate degree, just a bachelor's, add about a million to that. that. That's what a law school buys you in today's dollars, which will 
deflate as things spiral out of control. <laughs> that make you happy or sad? Why, why is it just a million dollars? On top. It adds roughly a million dollars for earning potential over a lifetime on top of what the bachelor's gives you. Compared to the bachelor's. See, so look, 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 look at this one, right? The bachelor's there. This one's based on your average income per, per year. So, you know, just say at the age of, I don't know, 40, right? The average bachelor's degree is making like, what, 70 or so? And the average with a lot of you is making like 130. So each year you're getting more money because of the degree, it adds on top of that. Make you feel a little better? So you can calculate that I have a law degree. This, this is actually fairly controversial. People don't always agree with it, but I give this as a optimistic one. I can give you plenty of scam bloggers who think law school is a waste and that the market will go down and that this chart is just going to plummet. There will be corrections, and I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sugarcoat things. Uh, for the foreseeable future, things will not be good, but eventually you'll have a correction with fewer people graduating law school, and there will be a need. Um, you have to adapt. You have to figure out different ways of marketing yourself in ways that perhaps they didn't have to in the past, but there, 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 there's room. There's room. <laughs> well, I mean, believe it or not, now is actually a surprisingly good time to go to law school. Why? Because you can get in where your grades might not have let you get in before. You'll get more financial aid where you might not have got before. So, like, this is actually a thing. People are applying now. They're getting into top 10 schools where they might have gone to top 50 schools before. And a lot of transfers. Do you have any transfers coming up? No, did, no, did your class have any transfers out? Yeah. Day students? Yeah. Today's students, I always have a couple of kids come they're transferring out, usually the top of the class. It happens. Schools need money. Transfers are awesome because you can let them in with that. They're also at school dragging you down. They're fantastic. All right. Everyone okay with that? So let's let's do the um let's do the let's do the Graham case. Uh Marari, tell us the facts, please, of the uh the, the Graham case from Colorado. We had um Graham who did well for the American Flight attendant, we say. <laughs> yeah, I was actually on a flight the other day, and like this guy's being a total jerk. He's like, stewardess. I'm like, oh, you idiot. Like, like just. Anyway, so go ahead. All right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, okay. So the wife was a flight attendant. She was traveling around the you know, country. Uh, 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 doing all the money earning, and he was getting his education, right? How did they divide up time? Do you, do you, have, a, do you have a sense of how the time was, was divided? Uh, time or money? Well, what percentage of the time, how, how often were each working? <coughs> okay, good. So she was full-time working as a flight attendant. He was going to school, he was working part-time, but he was focusing mostly on his studies in MBA, all right? They also note that they uh, had house duties, and the wife cooked most of the meals, and she did most of the work. So this is a not uncommon story, or maybe back then, but where the, the wife will sacrifice and work to put her husband through school. And uh, let's see, uh, Sina, what do, you, what do you think the expectation was would happen after, after the husband graduated? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Fair enough. I got it right, right. So, what do you think the expectation was when uh, uh, the wife was working her bottle off as a flight attendant, trying to put this guy to school? Right. So, she was working, and she thought, okay, I'll work, put him through school, and then, then when he works, he'll get a job, whatever. Was there any kind of contractual relationship there, do you think? Remember that question we had last time? It was like, you know, if the, husband, if the wife takes care of the sick husband, is she doing anything special or is she just doing what the wife supposed to do? You, you would think that Yeah. So anyway, uh, I looked this up actually. So a flight attendant in the 1960s made $24,000 a year. Uh, now it's like a top American Airlines flight attendant. A Pan Am starting salary. Starting salary was one thousand dollars a month, which breaks down to about fifty thousand dollars today if you want to convert the dollars. So she was working; she was working pretty difficult. 
a pr pretty tough time. So they were married six years, and during the marriage, it says that 75% of the expenses came from the uh, money came from the wife. Uh, they had no marital assets, and they shared the various chores. So shortly after he graduated, he got a snazzy job paying $14,000 a year as an executive assistant. I think that means secretary, but I, I guess maybe it was a different meaning back then. So he gets a job for $14,000 a year. Shortly thereafter, they filed for divorce. I swear, I have so many friends who got divorced within a year of graduating law school. Um, you know where this also comes up? When firms are about to make part, when law, when lawyers are about to make partner, because when you become partner, that's a property share. So a lot of times, lawyers will get divorced right before they make partners. They don't have to share their their, uh, their partnership stake with the wife. We're evil lawyers, I'm, well, men, but but you know, <laughs> lawyers are evil. They think of this kind of stuff. So. The dude, they get divorced right afterwards. Uh, the wife was still working. Now, what's interesting is the wife did not make any claim for spousal support, what you might call alimony, right? Um, uh, Justin, why didn't why didn't the wife make any claim for spousal support? No, no, this is this is actually mentioned in the dissent in a footnote, uh, kind of obtuse. You've got why why didn't she why did she file for spousal support? Why could you, yeah, you're right. Why was she not allowed to file for spousal support? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So this is weird. In Colorado at the time, <clears throat> if the spouse could support herself, she was not able to get spousal support. In other words, spousal support was viewed as a way to help the destitute wife with no job skills, right? But if she was a working woman, a career woman, right? You know, she could support herself, and she wasn't, she wasn't eligible. So... Everything in the majority opinion says, oh, she should file for spouse support was BS. She couldn't. She, she was not eligible to file for spouse support. So the only asset that she could try and get at was marital property. Now, the difficulty in both cases we're going to do today, this one, the opera singer case, is what is marital property, right? Before I said you have, you know, equitable distribution, equal distribution. But the only thing that you're able to um, distribute is what's called marital property. And marital property tends to be very broad. There are only few exceptions to what marital property is, right? Uh, that, what, 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 what are the exceptions? What's not marital property? They mention this in the, uh, in the analysis of the case. Uh-huh. No, no, no. What's, what's exempt from marital property? It's, it, it's cited in this Uniform Dissolution of Marriage Act towards the beginning. It lists a couple items. Oh. Yeah, gifts? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, 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 those are the two main ones, okay? The only things that are usually excluded from marital property are stuff you had from before the marriage. So say you own some property before the marriage. That's not going to be marital property unless you retitle it as, you know, co-owned. What if you inherit property from your father who passed away? That is not marital property. That will not be split in half. That's yours. So the law grants certain exemptions for marital property. But generally, everything else acquired during the marriage is marital property. And this is community property, common law property. That, it's, it, here it doesn't matter much which, which kind of jurisdiction you're in. Right? So the issue in this case, though, is what about a degree, the MBA? Is an MBA a piece of property at all. Uh, uh, Brian, what, what does the court say? Is an MBA property? Even though there's something, uh, there's like a personal holding. Yeah, well, why is it a personal holding? Because you can't really split the property between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's personal property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah is not property. And they give a host of reasons why it's not property. 
Okay. So they give a couple of reasons. The first they say there's no exchange value, right? I can't go to a pawn shop and hand over my diploma and say, what can I get for it, right? I can't put my diploma on Craigslist, and I maybe I could, but you know, I I mean, people used to do that. They used to actually make counterfeit diplomas. You know the phrase diploma mill? To describe like a, like a, like for example, University of Phoenix or places like that, they call them diploma mills. They'll give a diploma to anyone. That phrase came from paper mills that actually print out diplomas. They would actually print them and sell them. They would make a counterfeit Yale or Harvard diploma. You could hang on your wall. I swear these exist. Right? What? You know about these? Hmm. If you get law school, you get, to, you, know, you get all that. Yeah, I mean, the most expensive piece of paper I have is my JD. It's most expensive. It's like this big, but it's really expensive. Okay? So you can't exchange it. Okay? You know, we talk in terms of bundles of sticks, the right to sell. Can you sell a diploma? I mean, you can sell the paper, but not the value of the diploma. You can't uh, transfer the, the, the credential. You can't transfer the uh, prestige. Can you assign it? You say, you know what? I'm going to go to school, and I'm going to assign my, my, my JD to someone else. You can't do that. In fact, there was actually, I saw this recently, there was something on Craigslist where some girl was, I think she was in Dallas, trying to recruit, she was like a, a, a mid-size, a medium-size uh, blonde girl who looks like me to take my exams because they, they, they require ID at the testing center. So she actually wanted to recruit someone who, who looked close enough to her to sit for her exams. She basically to direct her to give her exam scores. I mean, cheating goes on very bad. It happens a lot. Right? So we're not actually talking about the paper diploma. Right? Also, the other factor the court identifies is that the diploma itself is not what gets you the job. It's actually working and goodwill and perseverance and hard work. Right? You can't just pay for a, for, for a reputation. You can't just pay for a career. You have to work at it. Right? So the court basically disregards this. They say it's not marital property. Everyone got that? And then the court does something that borders on misleading and perhaps is disingenuous. They say, but, you know, there are going to be differences in the earning potential, for sure. The husband will probably be making more than the flight attendant wife. Okay? So for purposes of alimony, you can consider this. The earning potential will actually be enhanced by having this, this MBA. Therefore, if she petitions for spousal support, she can get more money. And then the court says very quietly, but in this case, the spouse did not seek spousal support. Well, no kidding, she couldn't under the law. I'm, I'm almost positive that law has been changed today. But at the time, if you had a job, you couldn't get spousal support. So the law, the, I keep saying law degree, the MBA is outside the scope of marital property. Therefore, a court cannot divide it. Right? Uh, Sherry, what does the uh, what does the dissent say? Right. Okay. Good. So the dissent says a couple things. First, the dissent says, "Let's be real, folks. Right? Let's be real. This is an economic reality. This lady busted her butt, gave all the money. She was a breadwinner." Put her, put her sorry husband through, 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 through grad school. And in this, quote, not unfamiliar pattern, the wife supports the husband, and they divorce shortly after. I mean, it, I, I don't want to say it's going to happen, but, but it's going to happen. You'll know someone. It, it, it's very common. He says, equity demands extraordinary remedies to prevent this injustice. Okay? Had they remained married after they got the degree, there would be no problem for whatever marital assets they acquired to be split. Like say after they got married, they bought a home together, right? They bought a car, they bought this, they bought that. That would all be split. But what this guy did, and I'm not trying to uh, shame him, I don't know if this actually happened, they got divorced before they had any assets. There was nothing to split up. They had, they had nothing. They were renting an apartment. They probably didn't have a lot of money, so there was nothing to split up. Probably a lot of debt, which they all split up as well. What the dissent says is that the property is not the degree itself, but it's the increase in earning potential. And they give a couple examples. So, for example, you probably did this in torts with respect to damages. If the husband got into a car accident, 
and there was some negligence, the wife could sue for future lost earnings, right? Right? So if the husband died, the wife could have gotten a cut of it, but because they got divorced, she gets nothing. Also, lost consortium. That was my favorite cause of action. Ever remember lost consortium? Yeah, I remember once I the fact pattern of my torts exam was involving um, a hot cup of coffee, and he spilled it all over himself, and actually threw in a lost consortium claim. Uh, cause <laughs> yeah. So, so, so this case basically says, marriage. I'm sorry, the MBA is not property. It can't be divided. Okay. This is the overwhelming majority rule. The overwhelming majority rule. It's in almost every state except for New York, which we'll get to in a moment. But does anyone have any questions about this? Yeah, a law degree, a doctorate, an MBA. I think there's actually a Texas case cited somewhere in there. Uh, I think involving a doctorate where a woman put her husband through med school, got divorced, happens, and then, then nothing. So merely financing education, and this is something which my friend in law school learned very well. He actually looked into this. He was like, wait a minute. I paid for her JD. I should be able to get something for this. And he came back next, like, no, I can't get anything for it. So he probably skipped this class on property. In fact, we did skip this class on property. I was in his class. We didn't. See, if we had studied this class on property, we would have saved a lot of money. But in my in my property class, we we didn't do, we didn't do family law. We didn't do any of this stuff. Yeah, Jeremy. Yes. Any assets they've acquired, a home, property, cash, jewelry, whatever, that's all marital property which can split. But the actual piece of paper itself, the diploma, can't. Depending, <clears throat> depending on the state, right? Depending on the state, the modern trend is in like in, in more liberal states is to go to equal distribution, which splits stuff in half. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes, sir. How to work with debt? <laughs> See, debt's difficult uh, uh, because you effectively have to. Debt's usually split. Um, even if the debt is all in one person's name, in theory, if both spouses benefited from the debt, like so say the husband took out a, a credit card in his own name, right? And he used that money to pay for whatever that they both experienced. Generally in a debt, it will be required that one spouse can pay off the other one's debt. So I, the example I just gave was say say, the, say one spouse has a credit card in his own name. And he takes on all this debt, and it's debt used to finance both spouses. Okay? They divorce. He now has, say, $50,000 in credit card debt. The wife would actually owe him $25,000. So what they would usually do is take $25,000 out of all the assets and give that additional amount to the husband to cover the debt. Yeah, I, I had a cup friend who got married, uh, divorced a couple years ago, and he had, some, um, he had some significant debt, and his wife had debt. And the way it worked was he got the house, and then he paid off his wife's debt. And he, they kind of did that swap. Yes? <clears throat> I don't think student loans, well, what's interesting about student loan is it's for an individual, right? In theory, a student loan is meant for an individual because it pays one person's tuition bills. But what people often do is they take loans for living expenses. So those might be in a different category, right? If you take out loans for living expenses, you use that to help contribute to the rent, buy food, whatever, that, that might also be a, a debt that both parties shared in. Yeah, it, it gets it gets messy. Now, if you co-sign with your spouse, that's a totally different story because then she's on the loan also, or he's on the loan. That's 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 you. That that's pr everything for the marriage for the marriage. For example, it's actually interesting. Like, say a boyfriend gives a present to the girlfriend, right? And then they get married. And then they get divorced. Who gets that gift? The gr the woman keeps it because it was a gift before marriage. It actually maintains its character as an independent presence throughout the entire duration of the marriage. This actually comes with pets and stuff, too. Yes? Pets are property, by the way. Pets are considered chattel. Yeah, and that's not divisible as uh, equal, uh, either equal or equal. What else? Anything else? Yes, sir. Well, that's the next case. Similar. Well, 
I'll answer your question in the next case, okay? With the opera singer. Other questions? Anything else? So they mention in the notes <clears throat> this Mahoney versus Mahoney. Okay. I'm trying to go back and find where it was. I can't remember off my head. Mm -hmm. um, so a gift, if I'm married and I get a gift from someone, that is not marital property? Nope. It's not. Nope. But that's to you individually. Now, if you share that with your wife, say it's a, say it's a, a, a gift of cash, and then you deposit that in your joint bank account, you just mingle that money, and now it's a community. So you, have, yeah, you actually have to take steps to keep stuff separate. In a community property state, it's even more difficult. You have your own bank account. You can keep stuff separately, but you have to arrange it that way. Well, before one case, you should individual. So I, I think that would be individual. No, it's shared. Yeah, no, I guess it would be my yeah. retirement. Re what, what comes up is so this actually comes up a lot. Pensions, right? So you have say you have a guy has a pension, gets married once, his wife gets a share of that. Gets married twice, gets a share of that. Gets married a third time, I usually get married a third time. So you actually you actually divvy up the pension. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, <laughs> that that's an exam. So what's interesting though? No, what's interesting is the three Ys will actually take your pension in proportion to the number of years they were married to you. There are actually formulas for this. So the number of years that a spouse say there's three Ys, right? They will take the spousal portion of your benefits. In proportion, some of years they're married to you for. This actually gets done when you have several spouses in one pension. Well, if you marry the same woman twice, which happens sometimes. They double up. Yeah. <laughs> She's competing against herself. Yes, sure. Right. <laughs> that is tough. Dogs are considered chattel. They're they're a piece of property. <laughs> so, so some states, remember this, Maryland actually has what's in the best interest of the dog standard, but that, that's the anomaly. That, yes, but, but, but child is custody because it's the best interest of the child standard. Dog is a piece of chattel, it's a property. Dogs are, it's very difficult in divorces. That doesn't apply to property. It's only for children. It, <laughs> Dogs are very difficult divorces. It's a tough thing. Yeah, it is. Always a puppy loses out, right? Yeah. All right, other questions? So the Mahoney case is this New Jersey case, which involves also a professional degree. And, and they say that, you know, this is speculative, right? Just having this degree, there's no guarantee you're going to make all this money. I guess they didn't see this chart, right? It's New Jersey. What are you going to do? So... But they did offer various forms of alimony based on reimbursing it. So actually, New Jersey, if my friend had contributed, say, $100,000 to the cost of a law degree, he could actually seek that $100,000 back. So not the earning potential, but in Jersey, you can actually seek back the reimbursement value of the degree, which is even weirder. But I guess it makes it fair. Questions on that? In New York, my, my former home state, it's the one state in the union that considers a professional degree or some sort of professional career marital property. And you can get it split up. And this is the, the von, von Stata case, or Elkis, as she's known by her married name. So any questions before we get started in the Elkis case? So this is uh, Frederica von Stata. They want like opera? Do you know her? Oh, Do you know her? You want to hear her sing? Who you laughing at? Yeah, this is post divorce. She's looking good, right? This, this, yeah, this, this is post divorce. Uh, what's fascinating is that, do you know who's a fan of hers? Justice Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg loves opera, and she actually named her one of her favorites. And get this, do you know this is a Scalia Ginsburg opera? 
It's, Scalia, it's called Scalia Ginsburg Opera. It's awesome. I swear, go, uh, you can find it. I'm going to go to DC next year and watch. I'm so excited. But it was actually a law student who couldn't find a job. So he graduated and became an opera singer, uh, an opera writer. He's writing an opera about textualism and originalism in Scalia. It's actually in Ginsburg. Because you know they're good friends, Scalia and Ginsburg, right? Did they actually have a picture of them on the elephant together? Oh. Let me find this picture. Scalia and Ginsburg are the best of friends. And they went to India together. And when they went to India, they rode an elephant together. I swear to God, this is real. Yes. So they, they rode an elephant together. Anyway, they're very good friends. Where did I, how did I get here? I don't remember. So, opera, right? The question in, in the Elkis case is not, I'll get to that in a minute, is not whether a professional degree is marital property. The question is whether the value of a career enhanced by a spouse is marital property. So, a Christian, what, what happened in the what happened in the Elkis case? Um, yeah. the divorce, oh, before before the divorce, let's talk about the good times first. The good times, <laughs> happy days, happy to hear again. Yeah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. He took some pictures of her, which seems kind of shady, but yeah. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. So, oh, that pic he probably took that picture. That was her good side, I guess. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. So, he. This was Frederica von Stada, uh, uh, who apparently was a very famous opera singer. And uh, they got married shortly after she started singing. When she first started singing, she was making very little, like $2,000 a year. And with a span of about 15 years, she shot to the top of the industry. She was making. I mean, over 600 grand, and this was nearly 20 something years ago. So this was a lot of money. She performed for the president, you know, so really big deal. And during the entire time when her star was shooting, her husband was behind her, and not only behind her, he was giving up his own career to support hers. He gave up his own singing career. He was her voice coach for 10 years, about all of it. But something happened towards the end. Uh, he was a voice coach. He would. Um, you know, encourage her to do this. He would travel with her. He would take care of the kids. So while she was out earning the big bucks, he was doing all things to make her big. Then at some point, their marriage reached a, 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 a point after 17 years. They filed for divorce. Now, they actually agreed of how to divide all their assets, custody, money, whatever. The only thing they disagreed about was the value of her career. And again, this is separate from alimony, right? This is totally separate. What they're saying is, what is the value that he put into this marriage, that he put into this union that, read, that led such a great um, uh, 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 success for her? Okay? So, Kurt, what, did, what happened here? What, what did the court say? Was this marriage part of the marital property that could be separated Give me your gut feeling. Give an answer. What's the answer? Dustin? What did the court do here? Why? Okay, good. Right, so they start from a very broad definition of what marital property is, right? Marital property is anything. It's not just money that one spouse brings into the union. It's any kind of services, right? That's the word I think they use in the statute. Services that a spouse brings in. So what services did, did the husband provide? He took care of the kids. He traveled around with her. He, he was her voice coach. Um, 
He was her, uh, you know, assistant and all this other stuff. So he actually was giving into the marriage all this value. And the court said that this was a thing of value. They and now, yes, Don. No, the lower court got reversed. Yeah, and I'm talking about the Supreme Court here. Yes, so in New York. Ah. Not, not, not the only state. You're on the track. Merrill, okay. So in New York, the highest court is called the Court of Appeals. The trial court is called the Supreme Court. Why is it like this? Well, you might remember in civil procedure that state courts are courts of general jurisdiction. A synonym for general is supreme. The trial courts are courts of supreme or general jurisdiction. They can hear any case. Family law, criminal, civil, whatever, right? For example, in Texas, we have civil district courts. We have family courts. They're separate. In New York, the Supreme Courts hear everything. So in New York, the trial courts are actually called Supreme Courts, and the, the, the highest court in the land is called the Court of Appeals. It's the same in Maryland as well. Maryland, the highest court is called the Court of Appeals. So that, Don, that might be why, what, what tripped you up. Uh, I, the, I thought I mentioned that before. I didn't. Okay. So we got the. It's called it's called the Supreme Court Appellate Division. So I didn't want you to ask that, but yes, it's called the Supreme Court Appellate Division. That's even worse, right? The Supreme Court Appellate Division. Like, what is that? But that's the Intermediary Court, in New York. And, and don't ever watch Law and Order. You always see like like New York Supreme Court part whatever. Did you ever notice that? Always doink doink. Like when it's a black screen with the white text, they actually say New York Supreme Court part something. And they're referring to which court it's in. No one ever paid attention to that part of law and order. I think I probably saw almost every episode of that show at one point. So, years ago. So, even though the wife's career is not licensed, right? We're not talking here about a piece of paper. We're talking about the earning potential of a career. And we think about this makes sense. There, there's nothing special about that piece of paper, right? What actually the New York courts say is the investment you put into this career, whether it's licensed or not, is worthwhile. So they hold that uh, her career is marital property. And the key part is that he enhanced her earning potential. Okay, the court also discussed that there is a potential for exploitation of famous personalities, right? So they have to be a little bit careful. They mentioned Joe Piscopo. You remember Joe Piscopo? Back in the day, right? So Joe Piscopo was in a similar situation. His husband and wife, uh, they were husband and wife, she helped focus his career, and then when he got big and fancy, he got a divorce. And the courts there said, you know, he has some sort of special talent, right? No one doubts that Joe Piscopo is a good actor, right? No one doubts that Frederica von Stada is a, is a good uh, opera singer. She was born with those vocal cords. That, that was talent on low from God. But the issue is that he helped her make the career, right? The talent's not enough. He helped that career to channel and focus it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm not understanding the logic behind the court's reasoning because in the previous case, the general education, I don't understand why this lady helped her husband in the last situation. Um, it's just that the other guy kind of helped which rule do you like better, the New York one or the Colorado one? I'm asking you. No, I'm asking you. What, 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 <laughs> are you the one working or the one? Well, which would you prefer? Huh? Which would you prefer? It, it literally depends on the situation because I don't understand. Well, I mean, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that just the issue? So I asked this last year and I got in trouble. But it, it, I should have day class last year. Is there anyone here whose spouse is putting them through law school? Yeah? Okay. Do you ever have this kind of a discussion with your spouse? About what? This? No. You? So he actually completed law school, then we got married, now we're in law school. Oh, so you're the one I mentioned, sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm just sitting here smiling because I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, did you and your husband, he went here? Or? Did you ever have this discussion? Because I'm sure he took this class like three years ago. 
So last year I had a couple people who then had the discussion after this class. But I mean, it's an interesting idea, right? The the idea that, when, I mean, but but in seriousness, when when you when your spouses decided to put you through law school, did you ever work on any arrangement of like what's gonna happen afterwards? You just said whatever, we're married. I love you. I don't really consider him putting me through law school though, because we both have our jobs. Okay, know, so you're working also. No, I'm a stay-at-home mother. Okay. And he works, mm -hmm. and I know that he's making the money. But I, you, before I had a child, I worked. I do everything around the house. I take care of our son. So even though I'm not making money, I don't see mm -hmm. it as him putting me through law school. I see it as both of us having our own jobs mm -hmm. and doing, you know, what we need to do. So we never have this kind of discussion. And and in truth, uh, 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 taking care of uh, the home and family that is actually contributions for purposes of marital property. Right. If one continues to be this way, but if one spouse actually does all the housework, does all the, the child care, that's actually considered part of the marital property. Yeah, Josh. How do you quantify? Mm -hmm. you know, how do you quantify the value? Is everybody value different? Is really hard. And also, uh, really hard. Is it, is, it, is it that moment in time, and how long does that vision last? And is it just one, one time split, or is it? A, well, when do you mean split? When are you talking about? Time of divorce. Well, if you, so so I mean, what the judge did in the in the, in the Colorado case was she, the judge effectively estimated here's the lifetime earning potential of an MBA grad. I'm going to chop that up based on how much the wife contributed. So like. He said the wife contributed 40% to the degree, so he awarded the wife 40% of the lifetime value of the degree. Well, well, the issue is it's all very speculative, right? There's no guarantee. I mean, even even with this lovely chart, right? You you might be on the bottom end of the tail, right? You might have a guy on this end of the tail, and you might have someone else on the bottom end of the tail. So the court will probably put you somewhere in the middle, right? You might be one of these lawyers, and you might be one of these lawyers. So you can probably put someone in the middle. That's what they do for an average. Eric? Back uh, to my previous question, of, like if the couple, if one couple did attribute to their best life in the you know, um, so like let's say the wife had a company and it was small before they got married, and then mm -hmm. they got married to like several of those good or old things. So, so this, this is known as goodwill. So, so it, it, courts have actually held that a spouse contributing to a business, even if not directly, but just kind of being around there, she can actually take part of that, right? Because you, because the wife's support, I think the wife, but the spouse's support is actually enabling that company to work. Trey? So then, like, if uh, I'm married and I'm working on a novel, and then my husband a book, right? Yeah. Yeah, my book like blows up. You know, we get. Well, this happens a lot with actors, right? I think there's something in the notes about this, right? So say you marry someone before they're a big actor and they get a big movie deal and they get several movie deals. The wife can actually claim that part of those movie deals were attributable to her. Yes, Josh? Usually it's a cash payment. Is it a one-time, or it depends on the agreement? Uh, the, the court can make it a one-time payment, or they can spread it over time. What they did in the Colorado case, they spread it over, like, 20 years, 25 years. Yeah. Yeah, watch it. So it's it's. Bill, to your question. Okay, what's your other question? It's it, it's quantifying. These things are very tough, right? How do you put a price tag on taking care of a child, right? Do you do you see what a comparable price nanny would charge? Um, often the case, a nanny might be more than the other spouse even makes because nannies, full-time nanny is really expensive, really expensive. A full-time maid can be extremely, a live-in maid can be extremely expensive. So I don't know how courts calculate that. It's not easy. And I have a feeling that, that the stay-at-home parent usually gets the shaft with the quantifying value. Because with, 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 with a working with a job, you can look at a pay stub, right? You can count how much money they're making. 
with a stay-at-home parent, you can't do that. It's hard. Yeah, second question? Yeah, I mean, these are all things that are very difficult. I think, I think the opinion that said this is not like a mathematical formula. I don't know. Yes, ma'am. It's unclear if you wanted alimony, but they had, they had settled that, so it wasn't in the record. Right? They had stipulated to alimony, they had stipulated to custody, they had stipulated to everything else. The only thing at issue was splitting up the assets from her um, her career. What was that? Josh, hand up. Are they... Um, okay. So, real or personal? Real property outside, um, we're going to do that... Uh, uh, Oh, we can do it now at least. So it gets very messy when you have a married couple that moves states. We're going to do this a lot in the next class, right? But but generally, where a person dies is where the probate occurs. And you will probate the various land in the state. If you have assets outside the state, if that was marital property held during the time of the marriage, you might actually apply the other state's laws to determine the distribution. It gets very messy. And, and I don't have an international law. I mean, it gets probably even messier. Um, in other words, I don't. Colorado law can't dictate how a piece of Mexican property or a piece of you know Canadian property will be split up. Trey, what's your hand up? Bill. But New York courts also say degrees property. Yeah, I mean, there the, was it the Maloney, Mahoney, something. Uh, that that case says that in New York, it's the only state in the union like that. That degree can be actual property. Yes. Okay, so 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 here is a deal with prenups, and we don't cover this in the class, but you can't screw the spouse over, right? You have to provide for some amount of fair distribution of assets. So if you say you are entitled to absolutely no spousal support in the event that I'm the breadwinner, that will probably not be upheld. That's why very often in a, in, a, in a prenup, they say specifically you will get X number of dollars for every year we're married, or you will get X dollars for every child we have. Like it's spelled out very clearly what you get for as long as you're married how many children you have. So It'd be, it'd be a prenup that effectively says you get zero would not be valid. Yeah. And, and even if there was a prenup saying you get nothing and he did all this work, a court could set it aside. I mean, prenups are an iron type. Courts can set them aside if they're not fair. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes. Right. So, so in the one case, the, the wife was working as a flight attendant. I mean, so she was supporting him, but not directly. In this case, he was her voice coach. He was helping her build her career. So I think this is an even stronger claim for any kind of division of assets. Yeah. Right, so so New York is the outlier. The normal rule, the normal rule in 49 states is that the, wife, the spouse who contributes to the degree gets zero. The spouse that contributes and supports the, the, the other spouse to get a degree gets zero. The working spouse gets zero. Josh? 
Uh, I, I had assumed, but I'm not sure. New York has very interesting marital laws. New York actually has a provision where usually you can only get divorced in the place where you live, where both spouses live. New York actually has this provision that if the marriage is performed in New York and one of the spouses lives in New York, she can get a divorce in New York. Even if, even if this other spouse doesn't live in New York, so then you get to haul, haul someone out into New York court where the laws are very favorable. Yes, sir? You mentioned the how it gets messed with actors sometimes. How what? So how what? How it gets messed with actors and how one claims that had it not been for him that he got some sort of music deal. What does that roll down to? Are they arguing it's like that emotional support that got him to that? Or? It doesn't even have to be emotional support. It's the union received success husband and wife, and they share that success. Right? She told him, you can do it, sweetie. Right? Or she said, you can do it, honey. And that was enough. It, it's this partnership. It's this fiction, whatever you want to call it, that whatever success one achieves, the other achieves as well. Let me give you another story. So this is actually a Texas case. There was a guy named Phillips. He spent 24 years in jail for these rapes. Okay? After 24 years, Okay, so he's in there for 24 years for rapes, and his wife supported him. She came to see him, she visited him, she cared for him, she called him, whatever. Okay? And at some point during the time he was in prison, she filed for divorce from him. She's like, I can't do this anymore, right? On the 24th year, DNA evidence cleared him, and he was let out. Okay? The state, Texas, paid him $2 million. He got the money after they're divorced. She wants a cut. She wants a cut. What's her argument? That she supported him during his time in jail. And that support, she give it. Now, <laughs> did that support lead to the $2 million? Was this a professional degree? Or did he get the $2 million because he was wrongly convicted? This is a difficult one. This I, I haven't followed how this wound up. This was, a, this was a, I think this is pending for the Supreme Court of Texas now. I don't think they have an opinion yet. So, did the wife, did the wife who said she grew distant and she didn't want to stay married to a prisoner, can now come back and say for 20 of those years that she gets a cut of the money? Yeah, because the money came from his time in, in prison. He was probably getting that cut. He was going to be in prison with Barney. And, and then his wife left him to rot in prison, and then he got, he got let out. But he earned that money by being in prison while he was there with him. Yeah, Josh? Yeah. Th that's what he's looking for. She's she's looking for the money from the time that she used to visit him, but not the other time. Bill. That happens a lot. Okay, this happens a lot when one spouse wins a lottery and they suddenly file for divorce. Like, you actually will have people filing divorce where they claim the ticket. I'm not joking. This happens. This is why people take so long to claim the prizes. It's like, honey, not working out. But when they bought that ticket, they were married. That's the, this, this is why you have a lot. Do you know that people who win the lottery are the highest incident of bankruptcy? It's actually not. It's a, it's a curse. It's not a blessing. People in the lottery often go bankrupt because, one, they don't know what to do with the money. Two, people cheat them. So not, they're not accustomed to having that kind of a, a, a wealth. Uh, so it's lottery is a terrible tax on the poor. It's not a good thing. Yeah. It, it's just two dollars a day in the garbage. No, it's it's a terrible institution. The state should not be running a racket. I mean, no use to run the lottery, the mafia, and then the the state said, "Wow, we can make money at this. Let's do it ourselves." <laughs> I mean, the lottery used to run the run by the mafia. That is called the numbers racket. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Sure. So let's talk about two concepts that, that no longer exist. Dower and courtesy. And I don't want to ever talk about these again. I'll mention them briefly because they're not important because they've been abolished. Okay? The dower was a way that a wife could get some interest after her husband died. What was it? After the husband died, the wife would get a dower, which was a one-third life estate on all the husband's land. So all the land the husband owned the wife would get a one-third interest for her life. That was meant so that you wouldn't have these widows who were left with nothing. And now that the woman was single, she could hold property in her own name. They didn't have this coverage or thing because the marriage was over. Okay? The, the 
what happens if the wife died before the husband? No dower. The dower only applies if the husband dies first. And again, this has been abolished in all 50 states. It does not exist, but it's for your own edification. No, it's not the final. It, it, it's been abolished. It doesn't exist. Okay. The courtesy, also been abolished, right? This says if the wife dies first, all the wife's property will go to the husband for the life estate. Notice the wife gets a one-third interest in the life estate. The husband gets 100% interest in life estate. So that, that's how things roll back then. So the wife dies first. She had some property from before the marriage. She inherited stuff. All the wife's property goes to the husband for a life estate. This is technically exists in four states, but it, it doesn't mean anything now. Like it's never used. Okay. What is used is a thing mentioned at the very end, which is called an elective share, which we'll talk about a lot more last time. Okay. And we'll finish up with this topic. What's an elective share? An elective share is what kicks in when a spouse cuts the other spouse out of his will. So you can imagine husband and wife, they're all so loving, and then like that lady last class, she's on her deathbed and she writes her husband out of her will. Right? This stuff happens. The elective share was also called a forced share legislation. Allows a spouse to opt out of a will. The spouse can actually opt out of a bad will. So say the will left nothing for the spouse. The spouse can say, no, I don't want to take what's in the will. I want to take what's in my elective share. Okay, and what's the elective share? Usually half of everything. Right? So you can't cut your wife out of your will. You can't do it. It's either a half or a third, depending on the state, but it's usually a half. What do you mean? Children cannot take an elective share. No. So this is if you have a spouse and you try and cut the spouse out of your will. She can opt out saying, nope, nope, I don't want this. Give me my elective share. My, my, I'm electing to have this share, which is depending on, say, either a half or a third. Gets divided up with everyone else. Sure. Was that what she wanted to do? Yeah. Did she have money? I don't have a comment. Like yeah, so what happened? Where did her money go? Well, it's actually Was this in Texas? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but in community property states, there is no elective share. Write this in big fat letters. In community property states like Texas, there's no elective share. On the exam, I don't want you to tell me in Texas someone elects in a share. This happens every year, like one or two people do it. It doesn't exist. Okay? This might be an issue if a person like moves from one state to another, like they say they get married in New York and they move to Texas, whatever. Then there might be an issue. But in Texas, there is no elective share. Okay? The reason why is that in Texas you can't cut your spouse out of the will because all the property is shared. Right? You can't cut a spouse out of the will because all the property is shared. We'll do. This will make more sense in the next class when we do. We do uh, uh, the 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 uh, community property state. We'll do this a lot more next class. But but there's there's no elective share in a community property state. They tell this funny story in the footnote where um you know there's a wedding ceremony. The man puts the ring on the finger. The minister says, "I now pronounce you man and wife." Then the man drops dead. Married elective share. Because uh, they tried to cut the uh, <laughs> the wife out of the problem. Okay. 
Anything else in your minds? Anything else? All right. Have a wonderful evening. I will see you all. Some of you to the museum on Friday. If not, email me. I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.